So the president just signed a bipartisan Safer Community Act in reaction to the events, the tragic events that took place in Uvalde. But the interesting thing is when you break down the act, we'll get into it, none of it would have prevented the shooter from doing what he did in Uvalde. So why are we thinking like we finally solved the solution? So I said, listen team, let's come up with some data because people lie, numbers don't. Let's look at the data, let's look at some stats. Will we find one stat that will say, here's what will tell us a big part of the story because some of the stuff they can do, maybe it would have prevented 1% of the mass shooting, maybe 3%, maybe 5%, but we're looking at what could have prevented 90% of the mass shooting. So here's what we're gonna look at. Timeline of gun control in US. What the average American gun owner looks like, highest gun owning state, lowest gun owning, gun owning state, number of guns purchased last year, gun ownership by firearm type, what solutions work and what solutions don't. So let's get right into it. So let's take a look at what the average American gun owner looks like in America. We have the most guns per capita, roughly 400 million guns we own, which is like 120 and a half per hundred. But here's what it looks like. 74% of the time, it's a male. 82% white, 31% married, 40% have children, 44% of them live in the South. 30% of the time, they're between 50 to 64 years old, lives in a suburban area 45% of the time, 28% of them have a college degree, 48% of them are politically independent, 51% of them are Republican, 48% own guns for protection, 32% own it for hunting, 79% believe owning a gun makes them safer, and 79% of them are in favor of background checks for private and gun show sales. So now that we know the proponents of gun control and the opponents of gun control, and we know the profile of what a gun owner looks like, let's see the timeline of gun control in America. 1791, the Bill of Rights, including the Second Amendment gains final ratification. The Second Amendment reads, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. 1837, Georgia passes a law banning handguns. The law is ruled unconstitutional by the Supreme Court and is thrown out. 1865, in a reaction to emancipation, several southern states adopt black codes, which among other things forbid black persons from possessing firearms. 1871, the NRA is organized around its primary goal of improving American civilians' marksmanship in preparation for war. 1934, the National Firearms Act of 1934 regulating the manufacture, sale, and possession of fully automatic firearms like submachine guns is approved by Congress. 1938, the Federal Firearms Act of 1938 places the first limitation on selling ordinary firearms Persons selling guns are required to obtain a firearms license at an annual cost of a dollar and to maintain records of the name and address and address of persons to whom firearms are sold. Gun sales to persons convicted of felonies were prohibited. 1968, the Gun Control Act of 1968 is enacted for the purpose of keeping firearms out of the hands of those not guilty entitled to possess them because of age, criminal background, or incompetence. 1972, ATF is created, listing as part of its mission the control of illegal use and sale of firearms and the enforcement of federal firearm laws. The ATF issues firearm license and conducts firearms license qualifications and compliance inspections. 1997, the U.S. Supreme Court, in the case of Prince versus United States, declares the background check requirement of the Brady Handgun Violence Prevention Act unconstitutional. Florida Supreme Court upholds the jury's $11.5 million verdict against Kmart for selling a gun to an intoxicated man who used the gun to shoot his estranged girlfriend. November 12, 1998, Chicago files a $433 million suit against local gun dealers and makers alleging that oversupplying local markets provided guns to criminals. April 20, 1999, at Columbine High School near Denver, student Eric Harris and Dylan Klebold shoot and kill 12 other students and a teacher and wound 24 others before killing themselves. The attack renews debate on the need for more restrictive gun control. May 20, 1999, exactly a month later, by a 51-50 vote with a tiebreaker vote cast by Vice President Al Gore, the U.S. Senate passes a bill requiring trigger locks on all newly manufactured handguns and extending waiting period and background check requirement to sales of firearms at gun show. February 2010, a federal law signed by President Barack Obama took effect allowing licensed gun owners to bring firearms into national parks and wildlife refuges as long as they are allowed by state law. June 12, 2016, President Obama again calls on Congress to enact or renew a law prohibiting the sale and possession of assault-type 
weapons and high capacity ammunition magazines after a man identified as Omar Mateen kills 49 people in Orlando, Florida gay nightclub on June 12th using an AR-15 semi-automatic rifle in a call to 911 he made during the attack. Mateen told the police he had pledged his allegiance to the radical Islamic terrorist group ISIS. October 1st, 2017, barely over a year after the Orlando shooting, a man identified as Stephen Craig Paddock opens fire on an outdoor music festival in Las Vegas, shooting from the 32nd floor of the Mandalay Bay Hotel. Paddock kills at least 59 people and wounds more than 500 others. August 12, 2019, President Trump voiced his support for the red flag gun uh, confiscation laws. We must make sure that those judged to pose a grave risk to public safety do not have access to firearms and that if they do, those firearms can be taken through rapid due process, he said. So Barack Obama is saying you ought to have permission to take guns and wildlife and Trump is saying uh, due to red flag laws we should confiscate. Shouldn't be the other way around. It's kind of interesting, right, how you're going through this reading history. You're realizing maybe both sides can reason if they're willing to get into a room and talk. So now let's look at room, let's look at what states have the most gun owners. I'll give you top five on each side. On uh, the least gun owners, number one is Jersey, 14.7%. Then it's Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Hawaii, New York. Matter of fact, I'll give you five more. Connecticut, Illinois, California, Maryland, Delaware is in the top 10 least gun owning states with Florida being at number 11. And the most gun ownership in America, number one is Montana, then it's Wyoming, Alaska, Idaho, West Virginia at the fifth spot. So listen, either these stats are gonna get you to say, I wanna to move to Montana, maybe Wyoming, maybe I'll go to Florida number 11, or you're gonna say, oh, I don't, want, I don't wanna be in a place where people own guns. Maybe go to California, maybe go to New York, maybe go to Hawaii, maybe go to Jersey, number one, compete for least amount of people owning guns, but the choice is yours depending on which side you lean. However, here's some stats. With all the talks about gun control coming up, 2020 was the record-breaking year for the most background checks ever done in the history of America, and 2021 was the second highest year in the most background checks ever done in America. So a lot of these stats may be just stats I've been giving you, but this next stat could be the one that's gonna get you thinking. When I watched the movie Moneyball, with the story of Brad Pitt, that he's playing the story of Billy Bean, I brought Billy Bean to three events because the way they broke down what the most important stat in baseball was, was on-base percentage. Not home runs, not hits, not doubles, not triples, not pitching, on-base percentage, and they build this team that broke the record. They won 21 games in a row. Nobody could believe Oakland, smallest budget in the, N in the MLB, was beating the Yankees. So, you ready for the stat? Here's what it looks like. According to the Crime Prevention Research Center, gun-free zones, areas where guns are prohibited, have been the target of 94% of all mass shootings. Let me say this one more time. Areas where guns are prohibited, 94% of all mass shootings have been in those areas, which means only 6% have been in areas that are not prohibited, where somebody can have a license to carry. The criminals don't want to go shooting there because they know somebody has a gun. But in areas where people don't have guns, they're like, I'm going to feel more confident, go to this area. 94%. The staggering number is why such designated areas are referred to as soft targets, meaning unprotected and vulnerable. 94% of shootings has happened in a gun-free zone. Could that 94% change if those areas became an area where people can have a license to carry? Would the criminal and the shooter say, I'm going to be thinking twice before I go into this movie theater or this church or school because somebody may be carrying, I'm not going to mess around. Maybe, maybe not. I think the answer is yes. And by the way, do you hear when they say mass shooting? Mass shooting. 293 mass shooting in 2022 as of June 28th. And we're like, oh my gosh, so many mass shootings. What's going on here? I don't remember the numbers being this big. Well, they don't tell you the definition. Mass shooting is when four or more people got shot in one incident, but nobody died. Died. A mass murder is when four or more people died in a shooting, okay? So which number is more scary, 293? Or the number for mass murder in 2022 as of June 28 is 14. Now 14 is a big number, period. One is too many numbers that we have, but one scares people. 14 doesn't scare you. If we say 293, you're like, that's so many of them. But 14, that's not marketing when they talk about numbers, right? Having said that, let's take a look at what's in this Bipartisan Safer Community Act. So here's what's in the bill. Number one, $750 million to help states implement and run crisis intervention programs. 
This money can be used to implement and manage red flag programs, which are aimed at keeping guns out of the hands of those who pose a threat to themselves or others. Number two, this legislation closes a years old loophole in domestic violence law that barred individuals who had been convicted of domestic violence crimes against spouses or partners with whom they shared children or cohabitated with from having guns. All statutes didn't include intimate partners who may not live together, be married or share children. The new bill would bar anyone who is convicted of a domestic violence crime against someone they have a continuing serious relationship of a romantic or intimate nature with from having a gun. Number three, requires more gun sellers to register as federally licensed firearm dealers. Number four, more thorough reviews of people ages 18 to 21 who want to buy guns. The bill encourages states to include juvenile records in the National Instant Crime Background Check system with grants as well as implement a new protocol for checking those records. Number five, creates new federal statutes against gun trafficking and straw trafficking. The legislation makes it easier to go after those who are buying guns for individuals who are not allowed to purchase weapons on their own. And last but not least, number six, increases funding for mental health programs and school security. The money is directed to a series of programs, many of which already exist, but would be funded more robustly under the new law. So which one of these six would have prevented Uvalde from happening? $750 million to implement a run of uh, intervention programs? No. Closing the so-called boyfriend? No. Requires more gun sellers? No. Number five, more thorough reviews of those ages 20, 18 to 21. Juvenile record? I don't think he had it. Number five, creates new federal statutes against gun trafficking? Nope. Increases funding for mental health? How? Maybe not. So again, these are good. It's some progress, but would it have prevented many of these mass murders from happening. So look, at this point, you can say you're for it, you're not for it, but let me give you an idea of what markers we're really dealing with when it comes down to gun control. One is age, two is type of weapon, three is training, four is background checks, five is medical history, what kind of prescription you're taking, six is amount of ammunition you can walk away with, type of ammunition you can get, your upbringing and socioeconomic status, meaning did you, were you raised with a father, parents together, married, all that stuff. Next one is police training because Uvalde could have been prevented due to what the cops would have done. That was on them a little bit on what they did. And last but not least, length of time it takes to walk away and take ownership of your weapon. So let's go through these 18 to 21. I think I'm good with 18. I'm good with 21. That's something that we can hash it out and debate. Next one, type of weapon, semi-automatic weapon. You got, uh, you know, M16s, you got uh, rifles, you got guns. If you were to actually break down what percentage of the shootings were done by semi-automatic weapons or rifles, the number one weapon that they use when they're doing any kind of shootings is a basic pistol that they use, okay? We got three more left. One of them is police training. Those police who didn't go in to do their jobs and their captain was telling them not to go in, the captain should be fired. Or the people that didn't go in, there should be some kind of accountability to be in there. I'm not talking about prison time, but either this is not a job for you because I remember when we're in the military, there was an exercise we did where we had to low crawl and we're going through and they're shooting. It's late at night and it's scary. Some guys couldn't handle it. They stood up. That's a perfect opportunity to tell these guys, military is not for you. Go home. Some people are cops, shouldn't be cops. Some people are teachers, shouldn't be teachers. There's many opportunities when you notice you're just not meant to be a teacher. You don't have the patience for kids. You need to go find a different job. You're not meant to be a cop. You can't handle this kind of pressure. Go to a different job. Now, next item. How long before I take the gun with me? Now, think about this here. Tell me any reason why a person ought to be able to go to a store, buy a gun who's never owned a gun before, and walk out 5, 10, 15, 20 minutes later. Give me any reason that we're gonna need it, minus there's a war taking place and the government want us to be armed. Let's just say if that's the case, don't you think the government would announce and say, effective today, men can go get guns and all that. Let's just say that ugly situation takes place. Aside from that, why does a person need to get the gun right now and go use it? Can you wait a week? Have you ever been upset at somebody and a week later you got over it? Have you ever gone to an ugly argument with an ex of yours and a day, two days, three weeks later, a week later, you were over it? So if you can wait a week to get calm after deciding to do something bad, maybe we give it a week before you can walk away with your gun. What's wrong with that? Maybe we make it two weeks. So that's a discussion that can be had. But you know which one I think matters the most? The last one here. Here's what it is. Social, economic, status, father figure in your life. The more stability, the better the economy is, the more money people make, the, the less situations to want to be desperate to do something bad. 
Keeping the family nucleus together is important. We keep not giving enough credence to this. This matters. When I'm at home and my kids are running around doing what they're doing, my mother-in-law can say whatever she wants to say. My nanny, my wife can say whatever they say. And then when I come in, things change very quickly. Fathers have a certain influence over their kids that maybe mothers don't have, especially when it comes down to boys. Uh, we need to go back to recognizing the right values and principles. Maybe some of the values and principles we learned from our grandparents, maybe they're right. Maybe we need to go talk about some of that stuff. Maybe we need to say, hey, whatever denomination you are, whatever church you are, whatever faith you are, practice it. Take your kids to church. Take them to, maybe your school is a public school and you're not necessarily able to put your kids in an environment to learn some conservative values. I don't care if you're a Christian, Catholic, seven day, your, your, whatever, whatever, Jude, whatever you practice, actually put your kids in those types of environments because many instances in those environments, somebody can come across and play the role of a father figure to challenge, uplift, to say there's hope, good things can happen in life as well. I think that plays a very, very important role. So while we were editing this video, two other tragic events took place having to do with gun violence. One of them was in Highland Park, a suburb of Chicago. The other one was in Japan. The one in Chicago was by a Robert E. Cremo who decided to open fire at a 4th of July parade in Highland Park. Seven people died, 38 people were wounded. The rifle was legally purchased and Robert Cremo, check this out, had been visited by the police on two separate occasions in 2019 after he threatened to kill everyone and nothing happened, okay? And, and keep this in mind, this happened in Chicago, which has some of the strictest gun laws. And on top of that, the strictest gun laws also has the most homicides in America. Chicago is number one. Second place is not even close. So it happened in that city with the strictest gun laws. And the other tragic event was in Japan. The former prime minister, Shinzo Abe, was shot and killed during a campaign event on July 8th, the attack has completely shocked the country where gun violence is virtually non-existent. Handguns are banned in the country and people must undergo extensive tests, training and background checks to obtain and keep shotguns and air rifles. And you ready for the craziest part of the story? The, the shooter got the weapon, not from a store, not illegally in the streets. It was a crude homemade, he made it, the shotgun he used to kill the former prime minister, which has never happened. I mean, it's, it's, tough. it's an event that Japan is not accustomed to something like this. It'll be interesting to see how they come up with new policies. And just think about you're the next prime minister running, you're on stage campaigning, and what are you thinking about? You could be the next person. It can really mess with emotions. So again, these are two separate events in two different locations in two different countries where different gun laws are, but the results are both tragic. Anyways, having said that, I want to hear your, hear your thoughts. What do you think is the solution? If you're going to comment below with your emotions, do it. Totally fine. I disagree. I do this. I'm totally fine with that. But what I'm more interested in is, Pat, you missed this one area. What if we did this? I am only looking for solutions from reasonable people. If you got them, comment below. Having said that, if you want today's notes in a PDF, click over here to get the PDF. And if you want to watch another interview, in regards to this topic I did with Colin Noor, click here to watch that interview. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.